All right. Welcome back to our imperative semantics study. And you know, I pray that you've been enjoying this uh, series of imperative semantics. And today we have another one for you. Imperative speaking to that which is of vital importance that's crucial in semantics speaks to the branch of linguistics that's concerned with logic and meaning. And so our imperative semantic that we're going to be going over today is semantic. I mean, I'm sorry, covenant. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you know, it's covenant. You know, so we're going to be learning about covenant today and what, what it involves, scripturally speaking, you know, or it's a little different than what it has evolved into in our day and time. So the Hebrew word for covenant is bari, you know, and this is Hebrew for covenant. Now the definition, you know, speaks to a compact in the sense of cutting. So it speaks to cutting a compact, you know, confederacy covenant or lead. Um, that's the Strong's uh, BDB or Brown's Diary Briggs says a covenant, an alliance, a pledge. Agree, you know, it speaks to a disposition of contract and um, from, from Strong and Prothetus, it's a disposition, the last disposition which one makes of his earthly possessions after his death, a testament, a will, a compact, a covenant, a testament. All right. Now, when we look to our American dictionary, mm -hmm. we uh, find that a covenant is a mutual um, consent or agreement of two or more persons to do or forbear some act or thing. A contract stipulation. A covenant is created by deed in writing, sealed and executed, or it may be implied in the contract. Now, that's just the general definition of the word covenant in theology. You know, it speaks uh, to the covenant of works, it is uh, that is um, implied in the commands, prohibitions, and promises of Elohim. The promise of Elohim to man that man's Perfect obedience should entitle him to happiness. This do and live, that do and die. That's Webster's 1828. So, in conclusion, a covenant is an agreement between two parties in which each party has an obligation under the agreement to fulfill. The most solemn of all covenants is the blood covenant. And that's what we're going to be going over today and looking into. Now, there's a book called The Chosen People by Don Esposito, uh, which is which has uh, within the first chapter an excellent expounding of what an ancient <coughs> covenant looked like. And I borrowed heavily from that work for this lesson. So, in scripture, you know, we read about cutting a covenant. And as we saw, Barit, you know, um, is. This definition is in a sense of cutting. Okay, so in scripture we cut covenants, and except you know you know and understand you know what that means, then you don't really know what you're getting into. It's kind of like signing a contract without reading the fine print. You know, not a very wise thing to do. The word sacrifice in English connotes to give up something. But the original word in Hebrew uh, for offering or sacrifices is korban or korban, which we went over last week, meaning to come near, to become closely involved in a relationship with someone. This is the purpose of the blood covenant. Sin is separating mankind from Yahuwah and his offering or sacrifice of his son Yahushua is meant to draw us back into relationship with him. Hence, the new covenant of Yahushua is a type of blood covenant agreement and those of us who accept it receive forgiveness of our sins in exchange for our contractual agreement to perform Yahushua's commandments. It is a legal binding contract in the eyes of Yahuwah, and it is the, it is the most solemn decision that one uh, will make in their life. Let us consider the nine steps, nine steps, or the nine step process of an ancient blood covenant. There's, there's a nine-step process to the ancient blood covenant ceremony. This is not um, some form of ancient tradition, but the very ritual according to scripture that every covenant relationship requires. 
And so when you start hearing about it, you're reading about the covenant of Yahushua, the covenant of Yahuwah, they would cut a covenant, you know, and so you're going to learn what that entails today. So, step number one, take off your robe or coat. First thing that one would do is take off uh, their coat or their robe and give it to, to their covenant partner. Now, to a Hebrew, a person's robe represented who he is. Hence, it spoke to, it spoke to his covering or protection. So by taking off the robe, he is saying symbolically, I've got you covered. And by, uh, and I've got you covered with my total being and even my life if need be. And then you will do the same. It is interesting to note that our high priest took off his robe as he was being offered as a Passover sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You see this in Yoganah 19, 23 and 24, my first reading, please. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Yeshua, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, and the scripture might be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them. And for my vesture, they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Hallelujah. Okay, so we see that his coat was without seeing what was the top throughout. They cast lots for it. You know, Yahshua allowed um, his coat to be removed for us, for our sake. Step two, they take off their girdle or belt. Okay, so the next thing you do, or, or, or one would do, is take off their girdle or their, their belt and give it to their covenant partner. Now, an Israelite didn't use his belt to hold up his pants. Rather, it was to hold his weapons in place. His bow, his arrow, his sword were all held in his belt. Symbolically, he is saying that he has given to you all his strength and all his ability to fight. Hence, if anyone were to attack you, they must also attack your covenant partner. Your battles become his battles and vice versa. He will fight and defend you even with his very life. We see an example, a great example of this um, aspect of the blood covenant in 1 Samuel 18, 3 and 4 uh, speaks to the covenant of David and Jonathan. My next reading, please. Then, then yeah. Then Jonathan and Dawid made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to Dawid, and his garments, even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. Hallelujah. Okay, so we see they were making a covenant and they're stripping themselves down, you know, took off, took off his girdle, um, you know, took off his... Uh, his sword and his bow and his girdle, which would have held those things. So, and this would be the second thing, you know, because you're declaring, that, hey, you know, I got you covered, whatever you need, even with my very life, you know, hey, if I need to, you know, I'm going to fight for you. you know, so, Jonathan and David are probably the greatest human example of what a true blood covenant relationship is all about. Scripture teaches us that their souls were knitted together. There's a bond in, in a blood covenant that goes beyond human love and trust. It is truly loving the other person as yourself. Another, another excellent example of the blood covenant is in a human relationship would be how a marriage between a man and a woman should be. You know, for this is this too was a blood covenant. You know, and you know, the two were to become one. Their souls were to be knitted together. You know, so. Um, that too was a blood covenant, so you can see the same aspects within it. You know, now in our blood covenant relationship with Yahushua, 
he has taken off his armor and given it to us through his through our common death. You know, we read about this in Ephesians 6, um, verses 11 through 18. Our next reader, please. Put on the whole armor of Elohim, that ye may be able to stand against the files of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of Elohim, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. Then therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Ruach, which is the word of Elohim. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Ruach and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication of all saints. Hallelujah. Amen. So did you catch um, um, what was said in 11 and 13 as to whose armor it was? Verse 11 is says put on the whole armor of Elohim and 13 says what for take unto you the whole armor of Elohim so I want you to take note that it's not your armor it's Elohim's armor amen, amen. you know he has taken off his armor and has given it unto us you know as a part of the blood covenant that we have with him. Amen? amen you know um the third step would be to cut the covenant Okay, now at this point, they would actually cut the covenant by taking an animal or a series of animals and splitting them right down the middle. Mm. In scripture, an animal is only split down the middle in a blood covenant ceremony. After splitting the animal, they lay the halves opposite to one another and stand in betwixt the two bloody halves of flesh with their backs to each other. Then they'd walk through the bloody halves, making a figure eight and come back to a stop facing each other. In doing so, two things were implied. First, that both parties were dying to their old selves, that is, giving up their rights their, um, to their own life, and beginning a new walk with their covenant partner to the death. Second, they each point down to the dead animal and say, Elohim do to me and more so than if I ever try to break this covenant. In other words, they're saying, just split me right down the middle and feed me to the vultures if I ever try to break this most sacred of all pacts. We see an example of this cutting ceremony in Genesis 15. You know, um, in verses Genesis 15, 9 and 10, it says, And he said unto them, unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon, and he took all of Unto him all, and he took unto him all these things and divided them in the midst and laid each one against another. And the birds he divided up. You know, so we see Elohim himself instructing Abraham to cut a covenant. When ancient Israel entered into covenant with Yahuwah, they also repeated this most important part of the blood covenant ceremony. We know this from Yahoo 34, 18 through 20. It says, and I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant, which they had made before me when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof. The princes of Yahuda and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests, and all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf. I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life. And their dead bodies shall be for me unto the fowls of the heaven and to the beasts of the earth. Remember the vow that you had to say when you walked betwixt the, um, betwixt the animal and you had to point down and said, I don't keep this, this, um, this covenant. 
than y'all do to me um, as this and more so. Well, this is what Yah is calling back upon them. That their, their bodies will be meat for the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the earth. That they will be laid out even as that covenant, that, that calf that they split in order to make the covenant of the covenant. You know, I pray you can see that because that's not something that Yah takes lightly. You know, but he covers with them. No. Uh, yeah, I just said that. Never mind. So, we see here that there are grave consequences for breaking the blood covenant. This is truly a matter of life and death. This is the most sacred agreement, and there are requirements on behalf of both parties involved within the blood covenant. I would also like to point out a scriptural passage concerning the prophecy of the Messiah. It's found in Daniel 9, 26. It says, and after three score and two, two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, the, the words be cut off, is karaf number 3772 it means to make a covenant by cutting the flesh and passing it to the pieces so literally this scripture is saying that the messiah will make a covenant by cutting by the cutting of his very own flesh can you see that mm -hmm. and also take note that it said that he would do it but not for himself he didn't do it for himself. He done it for us. Right. You know, that we might come back into relationship with God. Amen? Amen. You know, that we might draw near. So, what a wonderful thing he did. You know, wonderful offer that is presented unto the people of the world. Amen? Amen? Okay. The fourth step in cutting the covenant would be to raise the right arm and mix the blood. Hmm. So they raise their right arms and cut their palms hmm. and bring them and bring them together. As they did this, their blood would intermingle. They'd swear allegiance to each other. The two would then become one. Seeing that each carried um, each was carrying one another's blood within themselves, similar to that of a, um, a marriage between a man and a woman, where the body of fluids are intermingled. So would they intermingle the blood? So. Each one had some of their the other's blood within them. Now, the word for one in Hebrew is ekhah. It is a word that denotes unity, and it is the word used in Genesis 2, 24, where it states that a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave um, to his wife, the two shall become one. Ekhah is unified. It denotes a knitting together of the two souls, just like David and Jonathan. It is being one in mind and soul and in goals. I pray that all might see that this is the type of relationship that Yahuwah and Yahushua want to have with us, as well as for us to have with one another, that we may all truly become a high and we become one. You know, and we see our Messiah praying for this in Yoganah 17, verses 18 through 23, my next to the three. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sake I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for thee alone, be these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent him, sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the word may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me, and thou hast loved me. Hallelujah. Okay, so... We see it says, neither pray I for these alone. So he wasn't just praying for them at that time. He was praying for all of us who would come after us. Amen. Amen. You know, so it um, says that they all may be one, even as the Father was in him and he was in, in the Father. You know, 
and that we might be in them and we all be one. So that's the goal of this thing. You know, step five of uh, cutting the covenant process would be to exchange names. That would be step five. So next day to change names much the same way as a wife would do with her new husband, symbolizing her subjection to him as well as her oneness with him. So in like fashion, you know, uh, we receive we receive his name. You know, the symbolism within the exchange of names also speaks to them becoming representatives of their covenant partner. Again, so when you look at one, you're also looking at the other. You know, and so you know, this reminds me of what's said in Yokanah 14, 8 through 11, that Philip said unto him, Out and I show us the Father. And it suffices for us. That's all we can do. See you, Father. Now, who shall say it unto him? Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works. You know, and so when Yahushua is truly in us and working through us, when people see us, they'll be seeing him. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. You know, and when you do or don't do something to one, you don't do you do or don't do it for the other. So you know, if I'm in covenant with Yahushua and I'm and I'm representing him, you know, and you don't do it for me, then you're not doing it for him. Or if you do it for me, you're doing it for him because we're one. Because mm -hmm. we're in covenant with one another. Anybody follow? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is why we see passages like Matthew Yahoo 25, 31 through 40 on that too. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Adonai, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Hallelujah. So you can truly say that because of the covenant relationship that he had with his brother. You know, so I, I pray you see how important this blood covenant thing is. You know, so the sixth step would be to make a scar or a token of the covenant. You know, and um, most likely this would have been made when they cut their palms. You know, now the next thing would be to allow a permanent scar to form from the cuts as a token of the covenant we made. So you're not just going to, you know, prick the, uh, uh, prick the palm. You're going to cut the palm so that you can have a scar to remember. Mm -hmm. All right, you know, so that's what they would do. They would um, cut deep enough so a permanent scar would form um, where the cuts were as a token of the covenant that they made. It, it, it was always it was to always remind them of the covenant uh, responsibilities that you had to your partner. Mm -hmm. You know, so whenever you know you go to do something, you know, and you put it on the hands because that represents your works. You know, so every time you go to do something, you know, you got to remember that you're not doing it just for you, but also for your covenant partner. Mm -hmm. That you're not just, you know, operating on your own behalf. 
you know, but what you're doing is affecting him as well, you know. So, you know, everything that you do, you have to consider, am I representing my covenant partner uh, well? You know, and I got to make certain I don't bring no flack back on my covenant partner. Feel me? Anybody with me? You know, so that scar, you know, you know, um, is a constant reminder. You know, and spiritually speaking, you know, it always, you know, your works should always be considerate of your of Yah. Now, if anyone tried to harm you, all you have to do is just lift your arm and show your scar. And they know that you were saying that there was there was no more, um, that there was a bit more to you than just meet the eye. That if they mess with you, they'd also have to contend with your blood covenant partner or partners. You know, you raise up your hand and you got 10 cuts. They know that they got to contend with 10 folks, you know, coming behind you, you know. So, you know, that's that's an important aspect, you know. So, you know, not only was that scar a reminder for you, you know, it also was a reminder to everyone who see, you know, that you were you were in blood covenant with someone else, you know. And so, hey, you know, you mess with me, you know, hey, I have a covenant partner or partners out here that's gonna that's gonna um, come see you, you know, that you don't have to contend with. Them. So the star was a token that testified to the covenant. You know, even as the circumcision was the token of the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenant. You know, so there's a covenant to, there's a um, token that accompanies the covenant. You know, so the covenant has a token. You know, and so the token of the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants was, was the circumcision, okay? We see this in Genesis 17, 9 through 11. It says, And Elohim said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. Hallelujah. You know, and so that was the um, token of the, of the Abrahamic covenant, not the Mosaic covenant. The token of the Mosaic covenant was actually Shabbat, Sabbath. So it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't the, uh, the uh, circumcision, mm -hmm. you know. Now, for those of us in a renewed covenant, I would have a different type of scar or token than that of physical circumcision of flesh. It is our earthly father, um, the flesh, it is not our earthly father, but our heavenly father, which will perform, which will perform the circumcision, and it's a circumcision of the heart. Mm -hmm. We see this in Deuteronomy 30, uh, 1 through 6, my next reader, please. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, where the Yahuwah thy Elohim have driven thee, and shall return unto Yahuwah thy Elohim, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, the Yahuwah thy Elohim will turn thy captivity, and have compassion upon thee, and return and gather thee from all the nations, where the Yahuwah thy Elohim has scattered thee. And if any one of if any one of thine be driven out unto the uttermost, utmost part of the heaven, from thence will Yahuwah thy Elohim gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And Yahuwah thy Elohim will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And Yahuwah thy Elohim will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love Yahuwah thy Elohim with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, when your father from above, i.e. born again, Yahuwah, at some point, will circumcise your heart. Amen? Amen. So, I got a pop quiz for you. Don't you just love it? Mm -hmm. All right. 
How do you know? How do you know that Yah has circumcised your heart? Not by the fruits. By your love. Well, thank you for piping in, sis, but now that's not what I'm looking for either. If your heart is right, your mouth will speak right. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if Yah has circumcised your heart, he's done cut away everything that is not right, that is not of him. Mm -hmm. So if you know, your heart is right, your speech will be right. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be talking about um, going around talking about a filth, flam, filth mm -hmm. that you hear the people of the world speaking about. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to come out of your mouth is going to be what's righteous and true. Because he's going to cut all those things of the world away from your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak of. So, you know, Elohim is abundantly in your heart. And that's what you're going to find yourself speaking about most of the time. And that's going to be evident to each and every person whom you speak to. You know, now I can tell you the truth that everyone who knows me know my heart has been circumcised. Because I used to cuss like a sailor. Now, in fact, I probably put a sailor to shame. You know, yet, yeah, I circumcised my heart. And he took all that from me. You know, and now I open my mouth and Yah yeah, falls out. I testify of him. You know. And so that's how you can tell when your heart has been circumcised. Okay, step seven. Step seven is to give the terms of the covenant. So what they do, they stand before witnesses and give the terms of the covenant, and each would agree to the terms. They then state something to the effect of all my assets are yours. All my money and property, all my possessions are yours. If you need any of them, you don't even have to ask. Just come and get it. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. And if I die, all my children are yours by adoption. And you're responsible for my family. But at the same time, you also get all my liabilities. If I ever get into trouble financially, I don't come and ask you for money. I come and say, where's our checkbook? Everything I have is yours and yours is mine, both assets and liabilities. They then stand there and read, read off before witnesses both their assets and liabilities. Let us just stop here for a moment and ponder on this part of the blood covenant because it's most crucial. When we enter into a covenant relationship, everything we have belongs to our covenant partner and everything he, is, he has belongs to us. Now think about this and be honest. Who's getting the better part of the deal between Yahushua and us? <laughs> he is getting all our pride, our yeah. selfishness, our yeah. anger, yeah. And, yeah. and all the sins we've ever committed. And we're getting a shot at eternal life as a king and a priest in his kingdom. Oh. What an exchange. <laughs> what love oh, he has for us yeah. that he will willingly go into such a lopsided event. Oh. That's love right there. Yeah. You know, let's um, take a look at an, at an example of this found in Exodus 24, 1 through 8. My next reader, please. And he said unto Moshe, Come up unto Yahuwah, thou and Aaron and Nahab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship thee upon all. And Moses alone shall come near Yahuwah, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moshe came and told the people all the words of Yahuwah and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Yahuwah has said, we will do. And Moshe wrote all the words of Yahuwah and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. 
And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offer the burnt offerings and sacrifice, feast offerings of oxen unto Yahuwah. And Moshe took half of the blood and put it on the basin, uh, and half the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read the, and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Yahuwah has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moshe took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that Yahuwah has made with you concerning all these words. Okay. Did everybody catch that? Mm -hmm. Are you sure you got it? Mm -hmm. Why did they repeat it twice? <laughs> it was not to make sure you got it. <laughs> you know, if, if you notice in verse 3, it just told us, and Moshe came and told the people all the words of Yahuwah and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that Yahuwah have said, we will do. And then it repeats it again, you know, and so the question is, why? Well, it would help if we think about the step we're on mm -hmm. to give the terms of the covenant. Mm -hmm. So, so first, first in verse three, you know, Moshe was ex simply given the terms of the covenant. You know, they still had the responsibility to look over and consider what was being offered to them, and then decide whether or not they're going to go with it. So once they decided to go with it, then you know. They went, they carried forth into the ceremony. And so that's why when it repeats, you see Moshe, you know, doing the ceremony of the blood covenant and sprinkling the blood on the people and sprinkling the blood on on the uh the, the book of the covenant. The book of the covenant was simply all the words of Yahuwah and all the judgment. Hence in verse four, it tells us in Moses. Uh, Moshe wrote all the words of Yahuwah. So he wrote all the words and he made a book of the covenant that they were agreeing to so that they can always have a reference point as to what they agreed to. You know, and so after he got finished putting it in the book, he again took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience. So you got to have witnesses, read it in the audience of the people, and then let them give an answer officially. And they said, all that Yahuwah have said, we will do and be obedient. You know, and that's an essential aspect of cutting the covenant because you're subjecting yourself to your partner and vice versa. You know, so, you know, you're agreeing to the terms of the covenant. So there shouldn't be any opposition to you obeying those terms that you've agreed to do. Amen? Amen. Okay, so the eighth step is to eat a memorial meal. So then we would have a memorial meal to complete the covenant union. In place of the animal and blood, you would have bread and wine. You would take a loaf of bread and break it in and break it in two and feed it to each other and say, This is symbolic of my body, and I'm putting it in you. Then you will serve each other wine and say, this is symbolic of my blood, which is now your blood. Symbolically, you are, you are inside each other. This explains why Yahushua had the memorial supper. Found in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, it says, but I have received of the Adonai that which also I delivered unto you, that the Adonai Yahushua, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had sucked, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Adonai's death until he come. Do show that he is that cutting of the covenant. He is that animal that was um, that flesh that was split to make this covenant, so that there might be blood for this covenant. Amen. Amen. You know, um, 
but it doesn't come about precursor. You know, hence in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30, it says, Where for whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Adonai unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Adonai. So it's even as if you killed them yourself. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself. And I don't know why, you know, I, I've seen, you know, I've been to many a uh, uh, quote unquote communion service and I never hear them reading this admonition. And I just think it's absolutely essential. You know, otherwise you like telling people to sign without reading the fine print. But let a man examine himself and if so, let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drink of damnation to himself. Not discerning the out of the eye's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. They're not taking a nap. They're dead. Yeah. So that's huge, right? Yeah. All right. You know, step number nine, the final step. The last step to the blood covenant ceremony is to leave a memorial. Now, you do this by planting a tree that will be sprinkled with the blood of the covenant. Yahushua will fulfill this when he planted the mustard tree as a memorial of his blood covenant. You see in Matthew 13, 31 and 32, it says, Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the grapes among herbs and become a tree. It's actually an herb, but it grows so big that it, it, it grows as big as a tree. So that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, this word mustard seed, or the words mustard seed is taken from um, one Greek word, which is centipede. No, uh, no it's not the insect. But um, it's centipede. Uh, number 4615, it means mustard. It's from cinemai, meaning to hurt. Mm -hmm. That's pretty interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So the kingdom of heaven is like a seed of hurt. Mm -hmm. Thank you, crucifixion. See, because the seed represents love. And there's no greater love than except that. there's no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's that seed of hurt that was planted, that was sown into the world, you know, sown into the world or doctrine of the apostles, which becomes a tree, becomes a man that the birds of the air, the Ruko, the spirits of, of Hashemayim, the spirits of heaven come and lodge in. This is the memorial of our covenant with Yahushua is us being able to receive the Ruach HaKodesh. You know, beautiful memorial. Mm -hmm. Still around today, I mean. Yeah. You know, that blood covenant is still going on. You know, the only way out of a blood covenant was death. Mm -hmm. And it's even... Um, is believed to even survive death you know and that's what this the tree was for because it symbolized the eternal the eternal the eternal act the eternal aspect of the blood cup you know and so we see this with david and jonathan even after jonathan was dead david took responsibility for his son shibboleth mm -hmm. amen yeah. make sure you got right Treated him as one of his own sons. Yeah. Brought him to his dinner table. Yes. Truly, it's an eternal covenant. You know, and so the memorial is to show that even after we're dead and gone, our covenant still will live on through those who come behind us. So when we're properly covenanted with Yahushua, it should be evident to the world from the 
change of our speech. That is the circumcision of our hearts, as well as the memorial tree, because we should be walking. We should be as that tree walking, whereby the spirits of, of Elohim is lodging within our branches. And if asked, we should be able to read to them the terms of our covenant. Because we have a book of the covenant. Amen? Amen. So I pray that you now have a proper understanding of what it means to cut a covenant. That's all I have for you today. Pray it was a blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.